Hi everyone, we're here today to talk about the novella Dawn Shard by Brandon Sanderson. So I brought my husband here today because I know I've talked about fantasy and disability and representation a little bit on this channel before, and that was actually a major thing in Dawn Shard. About 75% of the point of view in the book is from a character who's paraplegic, so I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit today, since we've both read it, about that novella and how we think it did, and just some other things relating to disability and fantasy. So I'm kind of assuming if you're watching this video that you might have read Dawn Shard, or that at least you're probably a Brandon Sanderson fan, you've probably been reading the Stormlight Archive, so we're not going to be too careful about spoilers here. There won't be any spoilers for Rhythm of War because he hasn't read it yet. Uh, there might be some minor Minor spoilers for Dawn Shard. We're not going to give away the major twists or anything, but I think in order to have the conversation we want to, we'll probably talk about a few things that happen in it, and there will probably be spoilers for Oathbringer. I don't know. There might be. I'm not really sure yet. So this is not really a spoiler-free review. On the other hand, if you're not a Brandon Sanderson fan and you aren't reading the Stormlight Archive, there might still be a few things in here that you would find interesting if this is a topic you're interested in, so you might want to watch this anyway. All right, so first of all, just the usual explanation of what the book is about. Dawn Shard is a novella, like I said, that's set in between the third and fourth books of the Stormlight Archive. Brandon Sanderson likes to do these novellas, which are honestly, they're almost full books. I think it was like 40 or 50,000 words long, but it's set in between book three and book four, and these novellas kind of fill out the story of a side character that is probably going to be more important in the later parts of the series. So he will have stuff that is sort of important and interesting, but you don't need to read Dawn Shard in order to read Rhythm of War. It's just a nice extra. The main character of Dawn Shard, Risen, is a character who has been a character in the interludes in the first three books of the Stormlight Archive. So if you're not reading the Stormlight Archive, these are really, really long epic fantasy books and in between the parts of the books, there'll be a series of shorts with different characters in the world, some of whom end up becoming really important. Risen is one of the characters that was featured in those interludes. She is an apprentice trader who is traveling around with her master, learning his ways of trading. And in the second book, she has an accident that leads to her becoming paralyzed. And then in the third book, in Oathbringer, there's an interlude at least one, maybe there are two interludes with her, I can't remember. She has a little bit of a plot role, but that shows her after her accident and how she's dealing with it. And to be honest, that's not a plot line that I was very happy with. How did you feel about how it was handled in Oathbringer? So honestly, with the first time that I read Oathbringer, it didn't bother me too much just because I didn't really think that she was going to be a major character. I didn't really know that Dawn Shard was coming or anything like that. On a reread, knowing that she's going to become a more prominent character and, and all of the things that are happening both in the book and also in terms of what Brandon Sanderson is doing and trying to uh, create this character and, and do it well. I feel like, um, and this is a little going forward, but I feel like he's done a better job in Dawn Shard than where he was when he wrote that part in Oathbringer. Um, she's dealing with a lot of self-worth issues, which sure can be a part of uh, disability, especially for people when they um, get injured and then become disabled. But uh, I, I had hoped that she would be handling it a bit better than, than what was portrayed. Um, she seemed pretty helpless in a way that wasn't necessary, in my opinion. And I also just want to put out there, since we're talking about this, the experience of disability that's getting portrayed in this character is not your experience of disability. Yeah, I was I was born with my disability. I have used a chair for most of my life, um, probably like since third grade. But I mean, I wasn't able to walk since I was born. So it's, it is a very different uh, perspective for me. Uh, than for someone who had full mobility um, and was able-bodied for their whole life and then had an accident. Yeah, so we did see 
going into this book being written that it seemed like Sanderson was trying really hard to do a good job portraying this character. He put a call out on Facebook for disabled reader, uh, beta readers, particularly people who had that same experience, people that were paraplegic or like became paraplegic. So I know it's something that he was trying really hard on and something he really wanted to improve. So I think going into Dawn Shard, I felt both um, optimistic and also apprehensive. Is that... Yeah, oh, that, that's exactly <laughs> it. In fact, we almost uh, wrote to him applying for that, even though, again, my my situation is quite different from Risen's. Um, but basically, I just wanted to get my hands on it earlier. Uh, but honestly, it. I took a quick look at some of the early drafts because that got posted to the Kickstarter. Like, they showed the whole process of the beta read and it being revised, and you wouldn't have made it to the final version, probably. No, I, I think that I'm not meant to be a beta <laughs> reader. I'd rather just have the finished product. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, thank goodness we, we didn't even apply for that. Yes. <laughs> Also, as kind of another disclaimer, because I really love my disclaimers, I can't just give my opinion, apparently. I don't really like books that are issues books, even if it's something that is my issue, which this is very much not. But in general, I don't really like books about characters that are dealing with things that are too real world. Like when I was a teenager, I hated reading books about teenagers having a hard time being teenagers, just as an example. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I don't mind it as much, um, but a lot of the stuff where it does apply to me is usually stuff that isn't portrayed well. Um, musicians are usually not uh, portrayed in a way that is easy for any musician to actually read uh, or watch on t television or on film because it's just, there's something always missing in the authenticity. Um, in terms of disability, it's the same thing. Like sometimes I mind it, sometimes I don't, but it really depends what it is and how it's done. So I don't care as much, but I also don't really have as many times where it does fit into uh, an issue that concerns me. So I just wrote down a few questions that I wanted to ask you about your opinions about uh, Don Chard and some Sanderson stuff in general. I know this is mostly stuff we've talked about or been talking about, but I'm curious how you feel about how disability has been portrayed in the Stormlight Archive and I guess in other Brandon Sanderson books as well, because I know we've talked about that. Yeah, that it's kind of a mixed bag for me. Yeah, we have talked a lot about disability in Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere and, and also in other books and series, but um, Lopin is one of my favorite characters. And I just loved how he was and his attitude. His attitude and way of life um, and approach to life is quite different from mine, but I still appreciated him for who he was and um, how he just made the best of everything that, that he was doing. Um, I'm not as much into the self-deprecating humor as he is, but I enjoyed reading it. You know, it was hilarious. Like in The Cosmere and uh, I have to say also in... What was it called? Lightbringer? Yeah, in the Lightbringer series um, by Brent Weeks. The thing that I didn't like was that when there was an option of healing, um, the disability was healed. And the reason for that is this. Um, it, it's the implication that if you're disabled, you definitely... 100% want to be healed fully if you have that chance. And I know that for a lot of people that is the case. Um, I know for myself, I, I don't really know if I would 100% choose that or not. I, I have the life that I have and I'm really happy with the life that I have. So I think that if I were to completely change it, I don't, I don't know if I would want to do that or not. Obviously, also, given the options of what realities are in our world versus a different world, it's different. There's not just going to be some magic that comes in <laughs> and just heals you. Um, so there are different other consequences. But um, I think the part that annoyed me with Lopin was that when he became a Radiant, he also regrew his arm. And I know that it has to do with how they view themselves and all of that. And we've learned a lot more about it. But even on a reread and knowing all of that, that still bothered me for a little while. In Brent Weeks's books in the very end, so I'm sorry about the spoiler if you haven't read it and you're in the middle of it and it's old, so hopefully you already 
this isn't a spoiler, but uh, at the very end, basically everyone just gets fully healed from anything bad that happened. And not just that, they get like extra special powers. And that kind of bothered me. Um, there was there was no consequence in the end. There was still a lot that the character would have been able to get if they hadn't randomly been healed. Um, especially the one that I was thinking of. The, the healing felt like an afterthought. So I guess when there are characters that are disabled, um, I prefer just seeing how they live with the disability. And it's not that they can't have solutions or get healed a bit or this and that, but I think that I have more trouble when there's just this absolute magic that comes in and makes everything better for everyone. The only other character that really comes to mind in terms of having a disability that I can remember right now is King Set in the Mistborn series, who overall I liked how he was handled as a character because he's also someone that's paralyzed, but he has sort of a very large and in charge personality. He is authoritative. He doesn't really seem to have any self-worth issues and he's a very overconfident character. He has a family. I did feel like in the third Mistborn book he became a little bit more of a caricature of himself, but overall I think that character was handled okay. Do you feel the same way? Yes, but with the caricature thing I think it's just a, a few of the characters ended up that way and the disability part wasn't a problem with the caricature part. It wasn't handled as well in the third book, just in terms of, um, it just wasn't smooth. It was kind of brought more to the surface in a way that didn't enhance the it character. It became kind of a punchline. Yeah, it became more of a punchline. Not totally in a bad way. I mean, there were some funny gags with yeah, other yeah. characters. It worked out and it was fine. In the second book, it was fantastic because, and this is the type of character that I like to see, It you don't really necessarily think of the fact that he's disabled at that point. He's just a character and that's a part of who he is. I think that a lot of the time, and this we're gonna talk about a little bit with Don Shard um, and some others, where, where you start bringing the disability to the forefront and that becomes the main aspect of the character, that's what I don't really enjoy. I have enough of that in real life and I think plenty of other people do too. Um, and it's just my own opinion, but when I'm reading fantasy, I'm not reading fantasy to um, have the same struggles that I have <laughs> in normal life. You know, you're looking for a character who, sure, might be struggling with different aspects and, and has emotions and has troubles, but is also overcoming them and finding creative ways and maybe magical ways or different things, but they're doing their best to be their best self. And that's a big thing that I enjoy in, um, in fantasy in general. So I think when it becomes the main aspect of the character, that's when it gets bothersome. And a little bit in the third book with Set uh, of the Mistborn series, um, you got a little bit of that, where it was just being brought to the forefront in a way that didn't enhance the character, but just kind of talked about different troubles. And it wasn't like you got to see a creative way that he overcame um, his challenges or anything like that. Before we really get into Dawn Shard, are there any other examples in fantasy or science fiction of disabled characters that you particularly liked? Yes. Uh, my favorite by far is Miles Verkosigan. You, you win husband points for that one. Yes. <laughs> That's my favorite series. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like they really, um, I feel like he's portrayed really well in that series, but it comes from multiple aspects. And again, this will connect to the whole Dawn Shard aspect the world that he's on and just the whole universe, it's built in a way that can have people with disabilities. Now, his particular planet hates people with disabilities or mutations or anything like that and kills them normally. But at the same time, throughout the galaxy, there's different other groups where it does make sense uh, for there to be people with disability. There are solutions, there's technology, and there's medicine that makes sense. Also, all of his troubles come from him and not his disability. Sure, his disability is brought up and it's shown and he struggles with it and this and that, but it's not, his primary problem is him getting in his own way. And that's just a very human thing to have that has nothing to do with the disability. Sure, does he need to find different ways to get around his disability? Are there certain things that he can't do or probably shouldn't do and still tries to do? 
Yes, but that seems normal and adds to the character and who he is rather than being at the forefront of, oh my God, there's our poor main character um, has all sorts of problems and they're all related to his disability. And just for anyone who isn't familiar with the series, this is Miles Rokosigan from the Rokosigan Saga by Lois McMaster Bujold, which is a very long series. And Miles, who's the primary protagonist for most of the series, was um, his mother basically got uh, attacked with a poison while she was pregnant with him. And this led him to, in the end, have a short stature and to have like a brittle bone disease. His bones break constantly. And I, for example, in the first book, and this is a great example of, of all of this, one of the early parts of it is he's trying to get into the military because he's from a very militaristic world. It's expected of him. And everyone knows that he's disabled. He also comes from a, a very prominent father. And he has to deal with basically everyone thinking that the only reason he's there is because of his father. So he's found a way to take his tests and have his um, scores averaged, which will give him a better chance at actually passing these tests, these physical tests. And he's doing fine, he has a plan, he knows what he's doing. And then he basically gets coerced by a, a fellow trainee who's doing the course with him to do something stupid. And instead of taking the careful route like he planned to do, he jumps off a high uh, obstacle and breaks his bones. And then that's it. He loses his chance of being in the physical part of the army because, well, he didn't pass the test. If he had just done what he had planned, he would have been fine. So, but that all adds to the character and sure it's a problem for him, but the main problem was that he was being stupid. So Leo, what did you, what did you like and what did you not like about Don Shard? Asking me first? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to end up getting interviewed here. <laughs> I think it took me a while to get into it. I mean, it was still a really great little novella. I think some of the twists at the end were great. And I liked, honestly, I liked a lot of the other point of views more than I liked Risen's point of view. But for me, I felt like it felt a little too, felt like he was trying a little bit too hard with the disability stuff at first. Like nothing was wrong with it, but... In fact, it felt like he was trying too hard to be correct and put all these things in there. And I think we talked about it a little bit afterwards and we felt maybe it was trying, it was a little too real world. Yeah, absolutely. I felt the same way for the first half of the book. I was constantly being pulled out of Brandon Sanderson's writing, which is normally so easy to read and it kind of, I know you described it as like reading a movie where it just plays in your head. And he really is all about getting the language to uh, get out of the way of the story in a way. Um, and for the first 200 pages, honestly, whether it was disability or even like business related stuff, there were a couple of things that kind of took me out where it got a little too technical. And I can't tell you what word would bring me out, but I swear it was just, there would be a word here or there that was too non-fantasy and real world that would just pop me out. And like Leo was saying, for me, it wasn't so much what he was saying. Um, he was being very correct and very realistic in many ways. Sometimes that was too much. Um, my biggest problem was the uh, attitude of the character in the first half of the, of the novella. And to be fair, that character really changes, like how she thinks, how she is. And I actually really liked where she ended up. And it could have been an arc that worked really well. And I'm assuming that that's kind of what he was going for is kind of showing us where she was and where she ended up. And where she ended up was great, but it, it was not a satisfying arc. It was great halfway through to the end but the first half just did not work for me. Was there, was there anything else that particularly bothered you about it? It was mainly the feelings surrounding things. It wasn't even what she did or how she did it, but in a way how she was feeling while she was doing it or why she was doing it. I don't know if maybe it's just different from the face that I try to put out into the world or how I see the world, but it was just a lot more depressing and um, all those feelings of 
uh, inadequacy and struggling with self-worth. I mean, I think that, first of all, it's normal for people without disability to have those feelings, um, as well as people with disabilities, and it just didn't need to be harped upon so much, in my opinion. Um, and I think you even saw in the notes from from some people that they were kind of saying, like, because this is two years after her accident, that they were kind of saying, like, sure, maybe at first I felt this way, but two years later, I'm, I'm not still, like, wallowing in it in the way she was. And I'm sure that different people have different experiences with this. And again, I wasn't, I was born disabled, so it's very different in terms of how I grew up. But um, I, I just don't think that the world needs that much more of that portrayal of disability. And I think a more empowering one of of showing like what the um, what the solutions are, how they think creatively, what are ways to use the things around them to uh, make life better. I think that that's going to go a long way for people with disability and also for fiction in general when it's handling disability. And we do see her in this book working through various solutions for accessibility and things she wants to do. One of the things we were talking about was how nice would it be if there were more characters where they had already figured out all that stuff in the past and we just got to see them living their lives using all of the accessible solutions. So I think he was trying to portray in this book. She is in contact with other people that are paralyzed. She is trying out different inventions. She is trying to make things better, but it's very much a major narrative of her trying to adapt and make things more accessible. And I think that that part of it is great. And it's kind of interesting to, to think about it because we were talking about this. Um, for both of us, something that took us out of the novella a little bit was the fact that she was suddenly talking with a myriad of other people with disabilities through span reads. And I was kind of telling Leah, like, I don't quite understand why that would take me out of it because it would, it, first of all, it makes sense. It would be the thing to do in this situation as that character. Also, we have history with other characters doing that. I mean, Yasna has a group of alums that she's, you know, like people that she went to school with that she's still in touch with, that didn't take me out of it. I thought that was a really cool moment actually when that came up in Oathbringer. But for some reason, the way it was done here, it took us out a little bit more. Um, and again, not 100% sure. I know for me, it's still, obviously still a sensitive subject. So I'm probably even more hypersensitive to these things, but something about the way it was written right in there, each time it came up, popped me right out. On the other hand, there was an amazing conversation. And again, halfway through and then onwards, there were so many moments I was like, yes, we're getting to all those Brandon Sanderson, like sentences of truth, where he just gives you this golden nugget that feels so true to our world or just life in general. Um, but there was a conversation between Rissin, uh, Lopin, and Rushu that was quite subtle for some of the characters, um, but really spoke to, I think, at least how I have felt in real life before. I don't want to give spoilers and all that, but um, it was two characters, one that was currently disabled, one that used to be disabled, and kind of comparing notes um, covertly on how the world sees them and talking about things like that. And in there was also a character that was able-bodied who um, had very strong opinions that were not necessarily wrong, um, but it kind of showed the imperfections that we see in our world as well when, when we try so hard to do the right thing and sometimes get in our own way. Um, and I thought it was actually really cool that the end of the conversation flew right over the able-bodied person's head that they thought that they were doing something really great and um both the other characters were like yeah thanks for helping but you kind of got in the way in, in what they were implying one of the things that came up a lot in this book is risen as well as dealing with her disability dealing even more with how people see her and her disability, which I think is overall very true to the experiences of disabled people in our world. Most of them are just living their lives, but other people have a lot of um, thoughts about what it must be like or mm -hmm. things like, that. I don't know. How did you feel about that? 
Yeah, I actually, uh, a lot of that, I thought it was portrayed very well. Again, the only issues I had were how she was translating how people were seeing her, at least early on, um, with just kind of beating herself up. But in general, I thought that they did a really good job. Uh, I thought he did a really good job with kind of showing that, you know, um, sometimes people don't know how best to interact and sometimes people are perfectly normal interacting and that there's um, just a myriad of ways of you being seen and uh, sometimes misunderstood um, and sometimes perfectly understood, which is great. But uh, it, it you actually got with different characters, different relationships and how people do react to disability, which was uh, very subtly done actually overall. And that was fantastic that it was done in that way. I know you mentioned you felt like you don't feel the same way when people offer to help you compared to how Risen was reacting. Yes, that's right. I think for her, I'm trying to remember exactly, you can help me out, but I think it was along the lines of if someone was um, offering help, she felt like she uh, was useless and, and because of that, she didn't really want the help. Is that I think, approximately yeah, right? I think yeah. So. yeah. And for me, I mean, the way I see it is my first feeling is that's really nice. Like, thank you so much. I'm glad that there's kind people in the world. And a split second later, it's also the, I really didn't need the help, but I'm just going to, I mean, I think I told it to you in the terms of like, um, it's like dealing with a toddler that is giving you their toy, like, you know, 50 times while you're trying to have a conversation with another adult and you just are like, oh, thank you. Oh, you want it back? Here you go. So it kind of feels like that sometimes when, uh, people offer help, it depends on the situation, obviously, but if it's in a situation, I mean, we always laugh at this, but if it's a situation where, um, you know, I have driven somewhere by myself. I've obviously gotten out of the car and I'm about to get back into the car. And as I'm getting into the car, someone asks if I want any help. It's one of those things where it's like, that's very thoughtful of you. Thank you very much. No, I don't. Or I probably wouldn't have come out here because I didn't just plan to wait until someone nice walked by and saw me, you know, potentially struggling to get in and, and offer to help. So it, it's, I, I, I am very patient. Um, and uh and still grateful but, but you know patient about that because it's not always necessary so i think in that sense um i view it differently uh i don't really feel bad about needing help and i think i just kind of grew up that way i kind of grew up knowing that i should probably ask for help if i need it um also you like did not <laughs> I'm really, I won't ask people for help, like if I can't find something in a store. So if we're in a store together, sometimes we'll have a race where we'll go ask a salesperson to find it and I'll just see if I can find it first. Yeah. I mean, to me, the way I look at it is if there's someone else that knows where something is or can help me and make it faster and make my life easier, I'll probably ask. If it's a time where I'm feeling like I have been asking for help too much and there's plenty of stuff that I can do by myself and I'm just kind of being lazy about it and that's why I'm asking for help, then I'll pull back and I'll actually like make sure that I'm being more um, proactive in doing it myself because there's times where I can get into that. For me, I found, you know, it's also actually the opposite way and I think this is something that Risen is also dealing with of when does it make sense for her to be involved and when not to and not to feel bad about the times where you know she is kind of useless and let's be honest there's times where i'm useless too um i've learned that when it comes to moving things there's no point in me offering help because let's face it someone else is going to do a much better job of moving it and it's easier for me to delegate or just step out of their way so you know it's about knowing where you're most useful or not. And I feel like that should be for everyone. It just maybe comes to the forefront a little more obviously for someone with a physical disability. To be fair, you did help me move the table out of the way so we could film. Yeah. And it's not that I can't. It's just <laughs> that if there's like five people and there's me as one of the five, I should not be the person, you know, lifting and moving boxes probably. It might be faster if I let everyone else do it. That's fair. <laughs> 
one of the other things I think that you mentioned in terms of how people were reacting to her was that people were not understanding why she would want to do things herself or to do certain things. And you felt like that was a reaction that you've never gotten. Yes. Um, and yeah, that that's actually very true. And this kind of happened when she was on the ship and, you know, the captain and the sailors were kind of like, well, why are you, why do you want to be on deck and being sprayed by water and, you know, out in the wind and not comfortably in your cabin. Um, or even why do you want to be on this trip? Or basically, yeah, why do you want to be on this trip? And to be fair to Brandon Sanderson, there was another aspect to it that, um, as part of the plot, that kind of contributed to it. Um, but again, it was too obviously done. Um, I haven't had that happen so much. There were, there were a few times especially earlier on when I was younger. But I think in today's society, generally speaking, we don't have so much of that perception issue of why would someone not want to do something? Um, even if it's not something comfortable, but if they want to do it, you don't really question why do they want to do it? It's because they want to do it. I think, um, you know, back in the 90s uh, or like in the early 2000s, I was hit, smacking into that a little bit more, um, you know, for field trips with my class or things like that, where it's like, why do you really want to do that? Like, when to be more comfortable to do this? And a lot of the time, at, for me at that time, it was, I wanted to be with friends. I wanted to be just like everyone else sort of thing. In this case, for her, she wants to feel normal. It's very similar. Um, she wants to be able to do stuff that she's done before, even if it's not the, the most pleasant things that she did before. So um, I, I feel like that, at least for me, I don't think that I've really run into that in the last 10 years. I feel like just generally our society has moved away from that. I might be an exception. I don't know. But, and to yeah. be fair, we don't know how they treat disabled people on Roshar or on the different societies in Roshar because we've really only seen this one example, which was also kind of one of the things we were talking about with how fantasy worlds set up for disabilities and the problems with creating a world like Roshar and then bringing somebody with a disability into it. Yeah, because it's not really built in the right way for it. It's not that it doesn't have the technology or the capability or anything like that, but so far it has felt, at least with Risen, as though um, Brandon Sanderson wanted to write a character with a disability and self-impose that person onto his world. Um, Lopin felt more normal. Uh, Set felt more normal, but they were kind of minor characters. Um, but to have someone that it's more their point of view um, and that it's going to stick with it long term, uh, that was a little problematic, at least on Roshar. And actually talking about that in Perception, we didn't have that issue with Lopin so much. But it was kind of described away as in he was so self-deprecating and easygoing and all of that, that everyone was just comfortable around him. And I think we've all known those kinds of people in general in, in life. And to be fair, Lopin is somebody that doesn't have really an issue getting around since he can still walk. The accessibility of Roshar isn't really as much of an issue, even if he's not able to fully participate, you know, as a soldier. Yeah. And I mean, even, I guess the, he didn't even talk about this, but you know, even like climbing the ladders in uh, the chasms or anything like that, it, it never came up as though that was an issue for, for Lopin or anything like that. Um, and none of it. Yeah, there was no real um, issues other than he probably he shouldn't be a spear man. And, yeah. he and he couldn't carry, and he couldn't the, carry the bridge. Yeah. So how did we feel about Don Shard in the end, taking everything together? For me, um, the first half kind of bothered me a little bit uh, because of disability, but also even some of the business language um, <laughs> kind of took me out of it a little bit more, even though it was all true and correct. It just didn't feel fantasy enough. Second half was fantastic. Overall, I really liked the arc and I liked everything that we found out. And uh, I, I am actually really excited to see more of Risen in future books and see how Brandon Sanderson continues to progress this character because just knowing him as an author from seeing his other books, he always improves and is always striving to improve. So um, even if I'm being harsh right now to some on some things, 
it's only because I know that probably it'll all get fixed and I'll be extremely happy. And this will probably end up being my favorite author in terms of portraying someone with a disability because he usually tends to end up there. Yeah, I felt kind of the same way. It took me a while to get into it. I had kind of mixed feelings, but I overall liked the plot and I thought it was well done. I also appreciated that he was trying really hard, even though I felt like I could feel how hard he was trying. And I'm still really hoping for more disabled characters where it's just one component of their character and not this huge aspect of who they are. Basically, I think what we really need in fantasy and just in media in general is more representations of disabled people that are just living their lives normally and where their plots don't have anything to do with the fact that they're disabled. Or very minimal at the very least. Kind of like Miles, where it's not that we're shying away from it, but also it's not the core issue. Yeah. Is that basically? Yeah, it's funny because it is kind of a major aspect of his character in, in one yes. way, but I get what you're saying. And one of the reasons I think that this is important and you can agree or disagree with me, but I feel like, especially as a kid, I feel like reading fantasy actually made me a much more accepting person. I think reading different points of view and different characters, even different species sometimes, it makes you more able to understand other people's points of view when it's done well because you're exposed to things that you obviously don't encounter in real life. And I also feel like taking things out of the earth real world setting is also another way to normalize things and to explore things in different ways and do things differently. I think it would be totally fine to have a fantasy setting where someone's experience of disability was totally different than it is on earth. Maybe a experience where it isn't as much of a struggle or they can still be like a cool action hero despite having a mobility disability. Is there anything else? I'm just gonna say this. Yeah. Um, you probably don't need to put it in there. Uh, it just as one note in terms of what Brandon Sanderson could have done with Risen instead, that would have probably eliminated a lot of her uh, mobility issues was just kind of make her an edge dancer. I mean... Or Windrunner. Or Windrunner. So she could fly. Yeah, she could fly or she could just skate on the ground like Lyft does anyways. I mean, like, there, okay. there were some solutions here that where he didn't need to struggle so much. Skate, like, sitting on the ground? Yeah. It would work. It would work. It would totally work. I think. I guess the thing is, if all the radiants are getting healed, mm -hmm. then none of the radiants have disabilities, so they can't use their magic to adjust for any of those disabilities, which is kind of a, oh, lost, oppor it's kind of a lost opportunity. Unless they see themselves as... As disabled. As disabled, yeah. yeah. So that was kind of what you were talking about with the issues of characters getting yeah. healed. Yeah, that, that, that is true. So thank you to my husband for joining us today and letting himself get dragged onto the channel again to talk about this and sharing his perspective. Yeah, I, I'm really glad that I was able to do this and hopefully I can come back soon. I'll have you for a stupid video next, I promise. Like yeah. a really stupid tag or something like that.